everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Online. My name is James, and today I'm here with my friend Willie. Willie, how is it going? Dude, it's going great. How was your weekend? It was pretty good. It went by fast, but good. It does. Yeah, I yeah. feel like it always does. And but hey, we are here for Calvary Online, where it's great to be here with you. Calvary Online is such a great opportunity to be able to spend time and kind of get in the Word. And no matter where you may find yourself on a Sunday morning, you can always come back and be a part of the Calvary Church family. Mm. And so, Willie, how long have you been coming to Calvary? Um, this will be my second year. Your second year. Yeah. Well, I, I was, I've was i kind of been here, came and came and left and back, and so I just love being a part of this church family with you. But every week, we start with a kids' video. Can you tell yeah. us a little bit about that? Yeah, so our kids' video is just uh, full of Bible stories, you know, but geared towards the kiddos. And so it's, it's encouraging, it's teaching um, just for, for the kids. So grab them and come gather around and watch. The Bible, it's 66 books of history, stories, letters, and poetry that fit together to form God's one big story. The epic adventure of how he created us and loves us so much that he made a way to rescue us. As we travel through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, we discover people who met God and found their lives changed forever. Now, for an amazing story. Inspired by the book of Proverbs, chapter 25. Verse 16. Adeline and her younger brother Zeke had been waiting weeks for this particular Saturday. It's here! Yes day! Every year, their parents declared a yes day, where they would say yes to anything Adeline and Zeke wanted to do, with a few rules. We're not spending more than $15 each on anything other than meals. And we're not doing anything that could hurt you or anyone else. Can we have donuts for breakfast? Yes. A and ice cream? Yes! With whipped cream and gummy bears? Yep. Yes! Fueled by this sugar rush, Zeke and Adeline had energy to burn. Can we have a family water battle? Oh, kids against parents. Absolutely. The kids' super soakers were beating their parents' water balloons until Dad busted out the water hose. Hey, you can't use the house. Yes, do everything. Okay, fine. Pizza from Pizzano's for lunch. And monster cookies. Can I make them all by myself, please, please, please? Yes and yes. Dad and Adeline rode scooters to the store to get cookie ingredients. Yes! While Mom and Zeke took bikes to get pizza. Oh, yeah! Pretty sure that me riding a scooter half a mile is going to hurt someone. Probably me. It's sidewalk the whole way, Dad. Back at home, Adeline concocted the monster cookies with all the add-ins. Chocolate chips, M&Ms, peanut butter, toffee bits, candy corn, crushed pretzels. Are you sure that's going to taste OK? Yes. When the giant cookies were out of the oven and cooled, everyone had to agree. Mmm, these are actually amazing. Zeke and Mom could only give thumbs up as they chewed. After lunch, Dad and Zeke said yes to an epic battle of Ultra Luigi together. While Mom said yes to a nap. Adeline planned to say yes to a new episode of Super Chef Junior, but as she was leaving the kitchen, she paused and looked back at the plate of monster cookies. They did turn out awesome. It almost seemed as if those gooey cookies were calling her name. Adeline! Adeline! Well, it is yes day. Adeline grabbed another cookie for now, and one for while she watched Super Chef Junior. When Adeline finished her episode and the cookies, she passed through the kitchen to find Zeke and Dad. Adeline! Yes? The cookies seemed to smile at her with candy-coated faces. Well, yes, just one more. In the rec room, Dad and Zeke were still battling it out. He says you want to play? Adeline wanted to say yes, but her stomach felt a little queasy, and the flashing screen made her head spin. Uh, I'll just sit this one out. Don't suppose you could bring us a couple of those incredible cookies? Um, sure. In the kitchen, Adeline put two giant cookies on a paper plate. Adeline. Okay, fine. Even though her stomach didn't feel great, Adeline just couldn't resist that wonderful, chewy, cookie bite and candy crunch. She finished off yet another cookie on her way down to the rec room. 
Here you go. Thanks, sweetie. Hey, are you okay? Adeline grabbed her stomach as it churned. Her mouth felt sour. Yes. Um, no. Adeline sat down quickly on the sofa, but the storm in her stomach grew. She bolted off of the sofa and headed straight for the bathroom. It didn't take long for all those cookies, not to mention pizza, ice cream, and donuts to come right back up. Dad rushed in to help. Oh, sweetie, I, I know we've said yes to a lot of sugar today, but just how many cookies did you eat? Um, I'm not sure too many. Whoa, that is seriously disgusting. Mom was right behind Zeke. Adeline? I'm feeling better now, Mom. Honest, just too many cookies. Once they were back in the rec room, Dad shook his head. You're a walking proverb. You mean proverbs in the Bible? Sure. There's this great one that says, if you find honey, eat just enough. If you eat too much of it, you will throw up. Ugh, true story. Dude, did you put honey in the cookies? No, it doesn't have to be honey. It can be anything. I was going to ask what everyone wants for dinner, but... Toast, applesauce. Affirmative. I guess sometimes you gotta say no, even on yes day. Adeline's yes day hadn't gone quite the way she imagined, but at least she discovered a new skill to work on, knowing when to stop. Well, we hope that that was fun for your kids as they can help kind of participate into what Calvary Online is all about. Um, but Willie, this it's been kind of a it's been kind of a weird winter yeah. so far, mm -hmm. and it looks like tomorrow is going to be fifty eight degrees, mm -hmm. which is just absolutely wild for January. Yeah. And so, did you did you grow up going sledding a lot as a kid? Oh yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, Elmwood Park, you know, I grew up right here in Omaha. We would you know slide down a big hill, oh, and yeah, if yeah. if you couldn't drive, you know, to get to Elmwood Park, um, you we had a slope in our backyard not a big one but just enough, yeah, but to, enough like, to like go yeah, out yeah like, yeah, yeah like you're still having yeah, fun doing yeah. stuff i remember we used to drive to bellevue east that mm -hmm. uh, there's a hill mm -hmm. um on the back of the high school and it is like i think it's the biggest hill in bellevue wow. I'm, I'm convinced that it's wow. that but we went there as kids and um we got out and we had like these little saucers and my dad like put them on the snow and he's like okay sit on them so they don't they don't go anywhere else because mm -hmm. if they fall on the hill you're gonna have to go all the way down and get them yeah and so i, I sat on mine and then my sister like didn't and then my dad, like he saw that it's the, the sled started sliding mm -hmm. after my sister like bumped it, and so he ran and he dove to try to catch it. And oh he, my gosh! And he missed it, so it was still went to the bottom. He hit his toe on like where you park your car. Like oh, that my car oh my and gosh! Oh my gosh! Broke his toe. Oh my gosh! And so that was that's like that's like my most vibrant memory. But then we still stayed out all day. Still, still dad sledded. of the year. Dad of the year. Dad of the and year. He limped home. He dropped us off at home and then went to the hospital. So. Wow. But hopefully we get a little bit of snow so we can have some fun. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I feel like it, there's been just small little ones. I got my snowblower. I got it tuned up all for nothing. I don't know, James. I, I'm asking the online shirt. Like, you guys, please pray. Like, we do not get snow. Oh, I, don't I, get I, snow? Look, no, no, I don't want no snow. Like, look at this guy. I, yeah, no. The Grinch over here not wanting any <laughs> snow. Maybe I, when it gets to a certain point, then I don't want it. There we but, go. There we yeah, go. I, we can agree on that. Uh, yeah, yeah. But hey, everyone, we're going to get started with our services in just a few moments with the band coming out to lead us in a time of worship. And then after that, we're going to have a really unique time where we're going to be commissioning the South Omaha mm -hmm. Church Plant. This is a church plant that we've been talking about for the last couple of months. We're planning it with Elvin Torres, and it's called One Hope, and it's right in the heart of South Omaha. And so we're going to be kind of praying over him and commissioning him. So get ready, because I want you to participate in that moment. It'll be really powerful, and we'll pray over them together. And then after that, Jason Epperson is going to be out to bring the word. We're still in the series Mark, and, mm -hmm. and so, or Marked. And then, um, yeah, Jason's going to come out, and he's going to bring the word this week, and I know it's going to be incredible. So as we kind of we get into what we're doing today, I just want to encourage you to prepare your heart. Mm -hmm. Willie, do you, like, worship is a great is a great opportunity. Oh, yeah. But, oh, yeah. But, like, did you grow up? Did you love worshiping? Oh, I love up? worship. Love it's, worship. It's great, right? So it's, much, yeah. It's a great opportunity just to kind of prepare your heart for mm -hmm. what God's going to say. And for just sure. Just kind of, like, take a good pause. Mm -hmm. And that's really kind of what all of this is all about. So we're going to get ready to do that today. And so then at the end of our time together, we're going to be able to take communion together as a church family. And so here at Calvary, we use some of the traditional elements. No matter where you may find yourself, just grab something if you want to participate. So that's enough for this. So I want to encourage you, turn it up, because Willie and I, we're going to get ready yes. to worship. Maybe you'll see us on screen. 
You probably, you probably <laughs> won't see that. But we're going to get ready to worship, so turn it up, get ready, prepare your hearts, because this can be an incredible morning, and let's see what God does through us together. Let's go. Welcome. I'm so glad you're here today. My name is Melissa. We're going to stand, and we're going to sing out a new song this morning. It's called Grateful. It's about being thankful to God for His faithfulness.
take a seat. Well, good morning, Calvary. How are we doing today? Doing all right? Come on, I know you can do better than that. Good morning, Calvary. How are we doing? All right, doing all right? Yeah, there we go, there we go, there we go. Hey, I hope you're having a great morning wherever you find yourself. Those of you joining us across the street at Bellevue North, I hope you're having a great day at Shadow Lake. I hope you're having a great day as well. Online, Heritage Ridge, man, such an honor and a joy to be able to gather together and enjoy church together. Hey, I wanna introduce someone to you. Maybe you know who this is. Uh, he's been here before. This is Elvin Torres. Everybody say, what's up, Elvin? Hey, guys. Elvin is a church planter. One Hope South. Uh, you guys planted two weeks ago, right? Yep. Tonight is our is our third core team gathering, and uh, yeah, it, it's been it's been I've been greatly encouraged. Uh, and listen, we are planting a church where we don't have a Sunday morning space, so we're meeting in the evenings. It's the dead of winter. Uh, the we have a spike in the spread, right? It is playoff season. It, you know, everything stacked up that this is not going to go well. You know. And our first gathering a couple of weeks ago, we had 52 adults and a bunch of little ones running around. That's awesome. That's awesome. 52, and then last weekend was second weekend. Tell me a little bit about last weekend as well. Yeah, uh, so first weekend, we set up 48 chairs, because I was thinking, if we have 30, I'm going to say that's a win, and we ended up having to take more chairs out. Last weekend, so we, have, we are meeting at St. Luke's Lutheran Church Building on 24th and I. Uh, in South Omaha, about seven minutes north of here. And they're letting us rent their, their space. And so we met in the basement the first Sunday, uh, just in the fellowship hall. It was just the, you know, for fluorescent light. The ceiling is right there. Uh, you know, everything's sterile. There were no tablecloths. It, it, but, but we had a lot of people in there. It was, it was good. We moved upstairs to this enormous sanctuary that was beautiful with stained glass windows. Uh, so we, we did some things to kind of move it, make it a little bit uh, uh, more cozy, uh, but we had no sound equipment, and so we used the house sound. <laughs> like that, that kind of. I didn't quite get that. Can you try that again? Nope. Okay. Uh -uh. okay. Nope. And uh, uh, but but God moved, and uh, it was just great. And so I've just been greatly encouraged, and uh, uh, not only by uh, just the number of people that have been showing up, but how people have been stepping up. Uh, that is not just the, the leadership team, but everyone's stepping up and saying, hey, how can I help? Uh, what can we do to help move this forward uh, to multiply diverse disciples in churches right there in South Omaha? I love it. I love it. I would love to just ask you, like, what can we continue to do here? I know we're partnering with you. We're sending some folks with you. Uh, we're just, we're coming alongside you as much as we can. What can we continue to do for you and with you? Yeah, well, the first thing you can do is pray. Um, tonight at our, at our gathering, one of the things we're going to emphasize is that prayer is our primary work. Of all the things that we can do, uh, um, the number one thing we can do and we should do is pray. Get on our knees and ask uh, the living God of the universe to move and to move mightily. Ephesians says that he can do immeasurably more than all I, I think or imagine. And I don't know about you, but I have an active imagination, which means that I can think and imagine quite a bit. And the scriptures say that he can do immeasurably more than all I think or imagine. You guys tracking with me? Yeah. Right? And so would you pray and ask God to just uh, blow our socks off, to, to do immeasurably more, that he would back up his dump truck of grace and just pour grace upon grace on us. I just reminded of Luke 5 when Jesus um, tells Peter and his disciples to, to push out into the deep and to let the nets down. And they're resistant. And they say, what? We've been fishing all night and we've caught nothing. Yeah, because you say so. And they let the nets down. And you know what happened? They caught so many fish that the nets began to break. The boats began to sink. They had to call more help over. And those boats began to sink a little bit. And they had a banner day because Jesus said so. You guys with me here? Yeah. Right? And so would you pray and ask God uh, uh, to move mightily that we would put our nets down and that our nets would break? So um, that's number one. Uh, number two, uh, would you pray and ask God, what role do you, can you play? Maybe it is just continuing to pray. Maybe it's you saying, hey, that just like uh, uh, the Frankfurters, the, the Wilsons, the Phillips, the, uh, I'm forgetting somebody there, uh, people who from your church family have said, yes, I'm stepping out and I'm going with this new church family to help reach uh, uh, multiply diverse disciples and churches in South Omaha. Yeah. Those That's two awesome. things. That's awesome. So I'm so sure there's more, but I'm, I'm sure there's more. So pray, pray for you guys specifically. Pray yeah. that you guys will continue to uh, to grow and continue to see God just dump out all sorts of 
I, I, dump trucks of grace. I like that. Yeah. I like that. Dump, yeah. Pray for dump trucks of grace, okay? Can we do that? Yeah. Uh, and then also, if, if you would like to go, if you'd like to be a part of this church plant, you can be a part of it. And what's really cool about, uh, I know that you think it's kind of a, a barrier a little bit that you don't get to meet on Sunday mornings, you meet on Sunday nights, Sunday afternoons. That's actually kind of awesome because you could be a part of Calvary or a part of, of Benson and still be a part of this church plant at least during this, this core team time. Uh, yeah, yeah. So here's what I would love to do. For those of you who are in this building right now, uh, who are committed to going with Elvin, I would love for you to stand. And can you guys just come forward? Uh, we're gonna go ahead and pray for you today. We're gonna commission you. We're gonna send you off today. So if that's you in this place today, uh, come on up. If you're a part of the church with Elvin, come on up as well. Can I, can I highlight yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, I, and I do wanna highlight Felipe and Jared, you guys come up too, because we wanna pray for you guys too. Uh, so these two young men that are coming up, the one in the front is Felipe. Felipe, just waved your hand. And then uh, Jared, Jared waved your hand right there just so they could see you. And uh, Felipe is uh, from Chile, and he's been in the, in the States for about four years, and uh, trained chef, by the way. And I uh, came here to, to train uh, um, a, as a missionary, train uh, in the gospel so that he can go back and hopefully someday pastor and plant a church in Chile. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. And uh, we met in uh, late 2020, and, uh, and in 2021, he moved from Colorado to uh, um, uh, the Omaha area to help plant this church. Uh, and uh, with no guarantee, <laughs> with no guarantee, because this is going to go badly because we're planting during playoffs, right? <laughs> And, and, and this is, yeah, and, and, uh, and this is Jared, and, uh, and Jared is, uh, um, uh, uh, he is, I'm, I'm telling you, man, like, you have stirred my faith in, in like, just tremendous ways, because last summer, he was like, listen, here's what I'm going to do. I want to help with this church plant. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit my job and get something part-time so I can devote more time to this church plant. I don't pay him, right? Yeah, he gives his best hours to help, uh, um, uh, um, help serve and to help lead our next-gen ministry with our students. So I just want to highlight these young men uh, as they're helping to plant this church. So Excellent. Right. we got the Frankfurters here. Man, we're going to miss you guys here at Calvary for sure. Uh, you guys have been such a blessing and, and an honor to get to know and to be a part of this church. And uh, I know that you guys are going to go do amazing things with this young man. And so I'm excited for you guys, excited with you as well. Uh, can we just join in prayer over these guys and over everybody today uh, as we send them off today? Can we just do that real quick? If you are inclined in any way, shape, or form to reach your arms out, you're welcome to do that as we pray. Uh, God, we thank you. We thank you for today. We thank you for this opportunity we have right here, right now, uh, to just send, to send, to know that you're gonna do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine, and that God, you're moving in and through and for us. And I'm so thankful that we are a part of a church that thinks outside of just our own walls and our own establishments, but we think about other churches out there and other people out there that need to be reached by you. And so God, we're so thankful for the opportunity we have to partner with Benson, to partner uh, with Elvin, and to watch your kingdom grow in and through and for each other. God, we love you and we thank you. It's in your precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. Can we thank God for these guys one more time? Elvin, I'm going to keep you out here if that's cool. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. I've got a couple housekeeping items, and I want to keep Elvin out here. Uh, housekeeping item number one, uh, there's some games happening today. Everybody know that? Like, anybody know there's some games? Uh, you keep alluding to playoffs. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about it real quick. Who are you going for today, Elvin? Oh, Chiefs all the way. Chiefs all the way. Okay. All right. Uh, any, any Niner fans in the house at any of our campuses? On the other game, not, so I went to the other game. I'm here. sorry. I'm not even going to go Bengals fans because the one Bengals fan we have actually went to the game today. Uh, so I'm not even going to go there. Uh, any Niner fans in the house at any of our campuses? None. Cool, cool, cool. So we've got Rams fans, I take it, on the other game? Three of you. Okay, so they only care about the Chiefs. They only care about the Chiefs with you. Here's what we're doing. In a couple weeks on Super Bowl Sunday, I don't know if I can actually say Super Bowl. I think it's like copyright and I'm not supposed to say it. Um, but on the big game Sunday, uh, we're going to do something very, very special around here at Calvary. Uh, Scott and I are going to be here. You might ask the question, where's Scott at? Scott still has bronchitis. His voice is still not all there. And so as much as he would have loved to have been here today to be a part of this, he was unable to do so. Uh, but he will be back on Super Bowl Sunday specifically. And we are going 
going to answer any questions you have. And so we would love for you, if you've got questions about faith, about reading the Bible, about where we're headed as a church, uh, if we could kick one animal off the ark, what would it be? All of these questions that you might have for us, uh, I'm gonna give you a text number here in a second. It's gonna be on the screen. Text that number from now until Super Bowl Sunday. We're gonna compile all of those questions. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring a giant bowl out, okay? Just a huge Super Bowl. And we're gonna have all of those questions inside of the bowl and randomly, we're just gonna pull one out and I'm gonna read it and Scott's gonna have 30 seconds to answer it and he's gonna do the same for me, kind of 30 second theology uh, because a lot of people maybe not care about the games but they care about the commercials, right? Like we care about the commercials and so we're gonna take 30 seconds just like a commercial would and we're gonna try and answer the question that you've asked or the questions you've asked randomly on that day uh, by texting that number. So you guys, you guys all good to text that number? Cool. All right, so here's what I'd love for you to do. Go ahead and do that at any point from now until Super Bowl Sunday, Big Game Sunday, text that number. Uh, lastly, today is a very special day. Last week, Jason Epperson was here and he preached live to us. It was incredible. We love having Jason back with us. Uh, today, uh, we've got another message from Jason. So I'm gonna pray, then uh, you'll turn your attention to the one for one and then we'll watch Jason. Let me pray. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for this awesome opportunity we have to, to grow because of who you are and what you've done in and through and for us. God, we just ask that today you would allow us to see who you are in light of everything Jason's gonna talk about in the book of Mark. God, we love you and we thank you. In your name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. amen. Our mission is to live and love like Jesus. One way that we do this is by giving one extra dollar to help those in our community know and feel the love of Christ. We call this one for one. Last week, our offering went to a single mother who is struggling financially. Her daughter has received a recent medical diagnosis, causing her to miss work due to appointments and extra care. All of this is in addition to a failing car and inconsistent child support. Our dollars will go to ease the burden that she's been dealing with and show her that there's a community of people who care about her. Because of your generosity, here's what we were able to bless them with. This week's One for One was nominated by a member of Calvary Bellevue South for a woman and her two children who late last year suffered the loss of their husband and father. After being sent home from surgery, he began to feel intense pain only to return to the hospital the next day. Unfortunately, the doctors found that it was too late to treat the issues and he passed away just before the new year. Our dollars will go to support this family with the medical and funeral costs and show them that there is a God who loves them and wants them to feel hope. Thank you for giving to the one for one. When we give, we are working together to reach one life at a time. Hey, good morning, Calvary. How y'all doing? Man, it's good to be back again this week. Uh, so excited that we could be together again. It was a blast last weekend preaching on Marked by His Mercy. I had a great time in the afternoon. Uh, kind of talking about evangelism, talking about fishing with you guys. And so today uh, we are still in this marked series. And the passage specifically we're going to be in today is in Mark chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 35. And so if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. We're going to kind of work all the way through the end of Mark 4 into Mark 5 a little bit. And today we're going to actually talk about being marked by God's timing. Okay, now another, another word that in scripture they would use, they might not use timing. They would say marked by God's maybe kingdom or maybe marked by God's agenda. But in this passage today, I'm gonna use the phrase timing a lot uh, because I think that for us in our culture today, uh, that's, that's a word or a phrase we would use a lot. And honestly, sometimes we get frustrated with this timing. Uh, I don't know about you, but there's lots of times in my life I think, man, God, where are you at? Like, what, what, you know, it's time, Lord. Uh, but for me in my life, even as a dad, I know my kids have felt the same way. For instance, um, this was a while back. I was living in Louisville, Kentucky at the time. I was driving to speak in western Kansas uh, at like a retreat type thing in western Kansas over by uh, Manhattan, Kansas and that area. And I, I took one of my sons with me. The son I took with me was Bo. He was about seven years old. And so Bo and I climbed in the car. We started to drive. And the promise that I made to him was this. I said, Bo, I promise if you go with me, because he's like, Dad, I don't know if I want to drive that long. I was like, hey, Bo, I guess what? We will stop in the middle of the afternoon. We'll stop in the afternoon and, at a hotel, and I'll let you swim as long as you want. We'll go out for dinner. You can swim again, and then we'll go to bed. We'll wake up the next morning. We'll drive the rest of the way. 
And Bo's like, I'm in. It was the middle of the winter time. He was excited about it. So he climbed in the vehicle. We started to drive. We got up early that morning so we could be there. Then all of a sudden, we're driving, we're driving, we're driving. And Bo's excited. Like he's sitting next to me. He's talking about it. He's talking about, Dad, I packed my goggles. Dad, I packed the football. We can play catch. And as we're driving, we come to this town. And this town is called Columbus, Missouri. And it's right on I-70. And and as we're driving on this interstate going across uh, Missouri, he knows that that's where we've stopped in the past. He also knows, he's a smart kid, it's two o'clock in the afternoon and he knows you can check in in most hotels around two o'clock. So we're driving by Columbus. He also knows that at that hotel, there's a Hampton right there, there's a big pool and a big hot tub and he's thinking, that's where we're we're staying. He didn't ask me, but that's what he was thinking. And so as we're driving, I'm driving and we just keep driving. And he says to me, Dad, aren't we gonna stop? And I said, yes, son, we're gonna stop. And he goes, Dad, you said I could stop, you said I could swim. And he started to get frustrated with me, and ultimately he was frustrated with my what? My timing. I said, Bo, I promise you we're gonna stop, I promise you you're gonna swim, and so we keep driving, and the next thing you know, we get on the outside of Kansas City, which is about an hour and a half, and so by this time, it's about three o'clock, 3.30, and we start passing hotel after hotel after hotel, and he finally looks at me and says, Dad, like, I'm frustrated. Like, you told me we would stop so I could swim. Why, why aren't you not stopping? I was like, son, have I ever lied to you? Well, no. But dad, this is like, I thought we would stop in Columbus and now we're passing. Like, dad, that hotel, it said it had a water slide. I said, yes, son, but you see the water slide, it was small. It wasn't that great. He's like, dad, but it's just like, dad. All of a sudden, the phone rings. My wife's on the phone. It goes through the whole car, which, by the way, is pretty cool. And the next thing you know, I'm talking to my wife, Lacey, and Lacey says, Bo, how are you doing? And he just says, fine. And she goes, well, Bo, what's wrong? You sound like you're frustrated. Well, Dad said we were going to stop and swim. We still haven't stopped, and I'm tired, and I want to swim. And she's like, well, has Dad ever lied to you? Well, no. Well, then he'll stop. He'll stop, Bo. Your father, your father is like, he's faithful to keep his promises. And so Bo then closes his eyes. And I know we're about 25 minutes from the destination I had reservations for. Bo closes his eyes, he falls asleep pretty quick, and he falls asleep with kind of a pout on his mouth. You with me? Parents, you know exactly what I'm saying. Then all of a sudden, I pull into the hotel that we're staying at, and Bo wakes up. And when Bo wakes up on the west side of Kansas City, he wakes up, and the first thing he, he sees is Great Wolf Lodge. And he literally comes across the dash gives me a hug, jumps out of the car, he's jumping up and down, he's pumping his fist, he's so excited that he gets to go swim to do water slides, that me and him will swim and do water slides all day and all the night, and the next morning he can wake up and still hit the water slides before we hit the road. You know, in that story, it's goofy, right? It's kind of funny, your kids are frustrated, the time, you get it. But the funny thing is, is how true is that in your own life? Now, maybe your dad never took you to Great Wolf Lodge, my dad never did. But there was lots of times in my life that I've been frustrated with God, saying, God, why not now? You know, some of you in this room have been like me, and we're frustrated of, God, why not now? Like, why can we not get pregnant? Or, why did we get pregnant? <laughs> or the frustration of, God, how am I gonna find this job? Why have you not brought me the right job? Why have you not brought me the right girl, the right guy? What, what, like, Lord, what's the deal with your timing? Or the timing of, I'm sick and I gotta get healthy because of this. Lord, this timing of this, like. But the truth is, in life, we get frustrated with God lots over timing. And I guess my first question or my first comment is, really, when we're frustrated with God's timing, It's only when his agenda or his kingdom doesn't meet our expectations. My son was frustrated with me for an hour and a half on that trip. But just like me in my life, as soon as God delivers the thing that I didn't even think was possible, I'm so glad I waited. I'm so glad that I waited until I was 25 years old and out of college and I finally got to meet my wife and I married her. I'm so glad that I had to walk through different frustrating circumstances in my life because now I get to appreciate the circumstances that are good so much more. 
In some ways, all of us know the times that God has driven us by things that we thought would fulfill us, but then in the end, given us things that are so much greater. And for some of you, you maybe haven't journeyed with the Lord enough to, to have those moments, but I promise you they're coming. See, God has the perfect plan for you in this world, and what it means, but sometimes for us, it doesn't meet our expectations. Today in this passage, you are gonna see a group of disciples, you're gonna see people in this passage that want something from Jesus, and the truth is, when, when Jesus' kingdom doesn't match our kingdom, we find ourselves frustrated. So let's look at the passage today. We're starting in, in uh, Mark chapter 4. It starts in verse 35, and this is what it says. On that day, now first off, before we get here, I need to tell you something. What's happened since last week is the crowd has grown. Jesus has done more healing, he's done more teaching. He has literally, when he was started in Capernaum last week, uh, in, that, in that time frame when I was teaching, uh, and what's happened in this first, in the Mark chapter, into three and four is, he has taught, he has healed, he's went all the way down to Jerusalem, he's picked up more followers, he's came all the way back up through Samaria, he finds himself back in the same place, right on the Sea of Galilee, and there's hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people following him everywhere. He's fed them, he's taught them, he's healed them. And he finds himself on the side of the shore, and, and then when he's on the side of the shore, he's next to a boat in the Sea of Galilee. On the west side of the sea is Israel, and on the east side of the sea is, is a Gentile nation that if you go there, you'll be unclean. So all of his disciples desire for him to stay in Israel. And the reason they desire to see him in Israel is this, they want him to overthrow Rome. Family, don't miss their agenda. Every single one of these disciples have been oppressed their whole lives by Rome. This nation has been oppressed for over 600 years by different nations. And in this moment, I promise you all of his disciples, Peter, James, John, Matthew, are thinking, look at these crowds. He's building this force. We gotta find swords. We gotta find all these things we can overthrow. Like We can be our own nation. The Messiah has come. And in this moment when all the crowds are there and they're looking for Jesus to give this pep talk, this speech about this is what we're gonna do, this is what Jesus says. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, hey, let's go across to the other side. I promise you their first thought is, Jesus, the people are here. And on the other side, there's no one that we care about. The truth is, all those are unclean people. They're our enemy. And it says this, and leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and the other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking in the boat, so that the boat was already filling. So Jesus then finds himself in this boat, all the disciples in this boat, but what did most of the disciples do? What was their livelihood? They were professional fishermen. They were pros at navigating the Sea of Galilee, and they were pros at captaining a boat. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking in the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern asleep on a cushion. Brother was out. He was tired. He was teaching all day. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're drowning? Do you not care that we're perishing? Basically what they're saying is, Bro, you're asleep in the back of the boat and all of us are about, like we're about to die. This is the time. This is the time for you to fix this situation. Lord, my marriage is a mess. Lord, my family is a mess. Lord, my job is a mess. Lord, we can't have this, we can't do. Lord, where are you? And Jesus wakes up and he wipes the sleep out of his eyes and he said this. And he awoke and he looked at the wind. He rebuked it. And said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. The hardest times in our life, the times we're the most frustrated with God's timing, are the times that we think we can control it, and it gets out of control, and then we wonder where he's at. The fishermen thought they could handle the storm at first. But then when the storm overwhelmed them, then they became frustrated with Jesus. He said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? 
And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Are we marked with God's timing? And really the way to say it clear for us is, are we marked with his agenda? Are we marked with his kingdom? Is our purpose and his purpose the same? Do we trust in the end that his timing is better than our timing? Because really what I'm saying is his timing is better than our timing is saying that his agenda is better than our agenda. The passage then goes on and Jesus gets to the other side and it says this, they came to the other side of the sea to the country of the Gerasenes and when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, first off, all these disciples are in this boat with him and their first thought is this, we're going to the other side just to get away but there's no way he's gonna put his feet on that dirt because as soon as he puts his feet on that dirt, their belief is he's unclean. There's no way the rabbi would purposely be, make himself unclean. But what's unclean about dirt, y'all, except for dirt? So Jesus does what? He puts his feet on the other side of the boat. And as soon as he gets out of the boat, their fears are realized. Immediately, they met with him. Immediately, they're met out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, with, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles to pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. This brother was crazy. In another passage, it says he was naked. So imagine all these disciples in this boat. Jesus is getting out of the boat, and Jesus' first comment to them is, hey, let's go. And they're thinking, Jesus, we can't, like, these brothers don't like us over here. Like, are you sure? Like, the crowd's over there, Jesus. We gotta get back. People over there needed to be healed. People over there were excited about teaching. Over here, all we got is, look, Jesus, look, look, look. There's a crazy naked dude. <laughs> like, that's what they got over here. Let's go back over here where all, like, the, our, our, our people are, our family is. And Jesus is like, no. And so he, he gets out of the boat and he says these words. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, what have you to do with me, Jesus? Son of the most high God. Family, I don't want you to miss this. That Jesus is, the demons believe in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So maybe that word believe in that passage means something different than acknowledge. In order for you to put your faith in Jesus, to believe in Jesus, it's not just the acknowledgement of. One way that I like to think about faith now is this. Faith is a decisive action. It's a moment in time that you say, yes, I will follow Jesus. And it's followed with a continued attitude. See, do you have faith? Because if we have faith in Jesus, it's a decisive action to say, yes, I will follow. But the continued attitude is, I will trust God's timing, not mine. I will trust his purposes, not mine. I will trust his mercy. I will trust his compassion. I will trust his truth, not mine. And right here, we see that even the demons, even the unclean spirits acknowledge him. And then Jesus says this, I adjure you by God. Or the, 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 the tormented man, the demons say this, I adjure you by God, do not torment me, for he was saying, he was saying to him, come out of the man, you, for he was saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly, do not send us out of this country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him saying, send us to the pigs. Let us enter them. So he, began, so he gave them permission, and an unclean spirit came out of them and entered into the pigs. And the herd numbering of 2,000 pigs, that's a lot of pigs, y'all, rushed down the steep bank and into the sea and drowned by the sea. I gotta point something out that has nothing to do with my sermon but it has something to do with life. First off is this, I love animals. If you don't know that, then you've never heard me preach before. I love animals, I have a dog named Blue. I've got chickens that give me eggs. Funny story about chickens, the other day, uh, Zeke was in the house, and Zeke is my four-year-old, and we're downstairs in the basement watching a football game, and 
Abe and Bo decided that their mom should make cookies. And so she said, yeah, I'll make some cookies. About 15, 20 minutes later, Zeke remembers mom's making cookies. He says, hey, I'm going to go check on the cookies. So Zeke walks up the stairs, and I hear him talking to his mom. I can't really hear what they're saying upstairs. Then all of a sudden, Zeke starts to walk back down the stairs. And he gets halfway down the stairs, and he says, we don't have no eggs. And I said, okay, did mom run to the store? And he says, no, dad. They come out of chicken butts. See, we have chickens. <laughs> and, and Zeke knew that his mom just walked outside to the chicken coop to grab eggs to make cookies. But the reason I'm telling you that is, y'all, I love animals. I've got two pet pigs. I used to have a donkey. I used to have a mule. I used to have a horse. Like, I love animals. But hear me say this very clearly, and I think this matters in our culture today, is this, is humans... You and I are of greater importance than animals. Sometimes today in culture, they want to make humanity and animals the same. Hear me say, if I see a dog who's hurting, I will help it. I will take my dog to the vet when they're sick. I'm, I don't want to be cruel to animals. But the concept in this world that we are the same is not true. And sometimes I think we have to remember those little things. Sorry, sorry, I preached a sermon about that. Anyway, verse 14, it says this. The herdsmen fled and told the city and the country, and the people came to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion sitting there, clothed and in the right mind. See, brother put clothes on because he knew he was naked. He's like, I gotta get some clothes on. He's not screaming, he's not yelling, he's not cutting himself. He went from being completely crazy to being completely calm. And those who had seen it described to them and what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. What? That must, I must have read that wrong. No, no, I didn't. Read it again. And they begged, and they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. And he was getting into the boat, and the man who had been possessed with the demons begged him that he might come with him. How could you, if you knew a dude... Was that crazy? You knew a dude was demon-possessed. You knew a dude was risk, like he was at risk for you. Like you couldn't take your girl on a walk by the sea because you were afraid of the naked, crazy dude coming down and beating you up. Like how could you not, if Jesus just healed someone you know, Jesus just healed someone that was a danger to you, or Jesus just healed someone you loved, why would you kick the brother out of town? Well, let me tell you why. Because the way in which Jesus healed this man hurt their pocketbooks. Do we care more for the economy of our world than we care for the people who are in it? He did not permit him to come with him. He says, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. This concept of evangelism, this concept of, hey, go tell someone. First is this, everyone else Jesus has healed what's he said. Shh, shh. But this man, he says, go tell as many people as you can because he wanted that region to know of him. And the way in which he told them, told this man to share his faith was just tell them what I've done for him. Hey family, do you know what all of us can do? Tell our friends and our neighbors how good God is to us. In Psalm 150, it tells us that praise should be with every breath. Last week in that class that I taught, I talked about that fishing is us just being in proximity with people that need Jesus and just being excited about who he is, telling him what he's done in your life. See, the time for you, see, the timing of God for your people, your friends, your neighbors to know him is now. And it doesn't mean you've got to write a speech. All it means is this. Man, this is what God has done in my life, and it's pretty awesome. The passage goes on and says these words. 
And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him and he was beside the sea. Imagine the disciples getting closer to the edge of the Sea of Galilee, coming up on the place where they left and they still see the crowd and they're like, whew, they're still here. Jesus, you still have time. Let's rally these dudes. Let's do this. Like They're so ready for God to do something so they're not oppressed by Rome. Don't miss that. The oppression that they're under, they want to be relieved from. They don't want to pay taxes anymore. They don't want their families disturbed anymore. And guess what? We can understand that. Like, God, when will this change? When will my boss not act this way? When will our government do this? When will our government not do this? When will the, like, God, rescue us from this thing. And none of us have any understanding, unless you've lived in a foreign nation, to what it is to be oppressed. Like, our level of oppression is them asking us to do things we really don't want to do. This level of oppression is they knock down your door and they steal your kids. This level of oppression is they kill you just because they want to. This level of oppression is when you make some money, they take what they want and you can't stop them. And we're frustrated with this timing. You, you, you see the difference? And I understand why the disciples wanted him to overthrow Rome. And the truth is, 300 years after this, they killed Christians for 300 years in Colosseums with gladiators. They hung them on posts. But you know what? It wasn't time to stop and swim. His timing doesn't make sense. But he's above all things. And he knows what's best for us. We get to the other side, and this is what happens. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogues, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet. He implored him earnestly, saying, my little daughter's at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that, he may be, so that she may be well. And he went with him. How long do you think Jairus was waiting? Do you think that Jairus was trying to get to him as he was teaching? Then he saw Jesus go to the other side. What do you think? Dads, moms, grandparents, siblings, what would be in your mind if, if one of your children or a sibling or a grandkid was sick to the point of death and you knew the guy that just right over there could heal him and as you're moving towards them, then you see him get in a boat and he goes to a nation of people that you despise. I promise you on the side of the, 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 side of the sea, I'd have been like yelling, Jesus, come back, my daughter's dying. I probably would have jumped in the water and tried to swim. But Jesus didn't stop. There was a storm. He's gone for a full day. And what would you have done? The same thing that Jairus did. You would have stood by the sea. You would have waited for him to return. Because you knew the only hope for your daughter was Jesus. So he says, I'm gonna read this again. My little daughter's at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so she may be made well and live. And he went with Jesus. And he's thinking that moment, get out of the way. Jesus is coming through. He's going to heal my daughter. Get out of the way. There is so much crowd there. Get out of the way. I got to heal my daughter. I got to get out of the way. I got to heal my daughter. And a great crowd followed him and, and was like encompassing him, it says. And there was a woman who had been discharged of blood for 12 years. This woman had been constantly bleeding for 12 years. Who had suffered much under the physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather even grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came behind him to the crowd and she touched his garment. For she said, I, I touch even his garments, I'll be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she had she'd been healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power had gone out of him, immediately turned to the crowd and said, who touched me? And his disciples said to him, Jesus, you see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, what was Jairus thinking right now? What were the disciples thinking right now? Don't miss this. What they were thinking right now was there's a little girl who's dying, Jesus, and you're talking to a woman who's been bleeding. Jesus, the time is now for us to go and for you to save his daughter. 
It's not time for you to have a casual conversation with this woman that's an outcast that lives outside the city who's been constantly bleeding. Great, she touched you, she's healed. Let's go. Jesus, we've got more pressing things to do right now than for you to have a conversation. Isn't that how we work, family? We prioritize our needs against others' needs. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house someone who said, hey, Jarius, your daughter, she's dead. Don't trouble the teacher any further. But overhearing what they said, what do you think Jarius thought in that moment? Devastation. I can't even imagine it. But, can you, but not only devastation, but probably also like, Jesus, I asked you. Jesus, we prayed. Jesus, I stood outside for days. And you were more concerned with a dude possessed by demons. And the truth is, he did bad things. My daughter is innocent. Jesus, why? But overhearing what they'd said, Jesus said to Jairus, hey, do not fear. Only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except for Peter, James, and John. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing out loud. And when he had entered, he said to them, why are you making such a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. They would have said, she doesn't have a heartbeat. She's dead. She's gone. You're late. Where were you? If you're supposed to be the son of God, if you're supposed to be the Messiah, guess what? He's punctual. You're late. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him, and he went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, little girl, I say to you, arise, wake up. And immediately their girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know of this. And he told her, he told them, hey, this girl needs something to eat. I have cried out to the Lord many times around a hospital bed, around a chair in a living room, God, would you please heal? I've been frustrated, I've watched you be frustrated. I've cried out, I've not understood why this person was taken and this person was saved. The truth is in this world, I don't understand always the workmanship of God, but I'm never gonna stop declaring his works. But the truth is, in those moments as we were gathering around that person and praying for them to be healed, when they closed their eyes in this world, they opened their eyes in the next and Jesus said, arise, arise, get up. And guess what? I got some food for you. Family, God's agenda and his kingdom sometimes don't make sense to me either. But my prayer today is that we will allow God to be God and us to be his children and we trust 
that he has the best plan. And we trust that he knows not only what's best for you, but what's best for the world. And we trust in our deepest moment of disappointment when we have someone we love who is no longer with us, that in the next moment, they walk through a thin veil called death and Jesus says, arise, arise, get up. And yo, let me show you what food really tastes like. Family, he is faithful. Even though you're driving by hotels, even though you want to stop and swim and you're still sitting in the car, I promise you, what awaits you is greater than anything you could expect. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We trust you. I pray in these next few moments that you will continue to give us the mindset and the words to follow you. God, I pray right now as we uh, take communion together, I pray right now as we, we, we take this bread that represents your body, the juice that represents your blood, that we remember the moment you went to the cross in the disciples' minds and in the followers of your minds they didn't understand your purpose, they didn't understand your agenda, and they didn't understand the timing. God, help us in these moments to repent when we think we know best. But God, thank you that you didn't follow their agenda, you didn't follow their timing, because if you wouldn't have had this moment, we wouldn't have forgiveness and death would have never been conquered. Thank you for doing what's right, even when it's different than what we want. God, I pray that this bread that represents your body and this juice that represents your blood will remind us that you are the only one that we should trust with our timing. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
us today for Calvary Online. We hope that you're encouraged no matter where you may find yourself in your walk with God. A couple of quick announcements for you. If this is your first time being a part of Calvary Online, we're so excited that you're here with us today. We would love to have the opportunity to connect with you at calvary.ch slash guest. It's the best way for us to get to know you a little bit and how we can serve you. And if you do call Calvary home, if you've been here for a while and this is your church family, again, it's always great to see you. But we, uh, I want to encourage you to be able to go to calvary.ch slash give and, and, feel, and give if you felt led to do that today. A couple of cool things that are coming up. Um, we have a worship night next Sunday. It's going to be at 6.30 p.m. Um, you can find more information about this on the website. But a worship night is an incredible night where um, our creative teams come together and make a really cool worship experience. And it's a great time to come and just be in the presence of God together with your loved ones. You can come and participate in that. It's going to be an amazing opportunity. Again, that's next Sunday at 6.30 p.m. And then Winter Escape, this is for our youth. This is for middle schoolers and high schoolers. Winter Escape is coming up. It's going to be February 11th through the 12th. That's Super Bowl weekend. It's going to be the 11th and the 12th. You can find more information about that at calvary.ch slash youth. And that is, it's always an incredible job. The student team does a really great job of having a jam-packed, super fun weekend for students, and it's not that expensive. It's a great opportunity for get your kids involved, get them plugged in. So again, if you're a middle school or high school, you will not want to miss Winter Escape. It is one of the best events that they do every year. And so that's all we have for you today, family. Thank you for joining us for Calvary Online. We look forward to seeing you next week right here.